uh, who wants a better sense of, you know, wants to be able to explain what they do to their family members at, over at the holiday party when they say, what is it you do? So that's the first audience for today's uh, event. The second audience are people who are interested in digital marketing, not aren't really sure really what it is and just want a simple, straightforward explanation of what uh, digital marketing is. And third would be clients who are hiring a digital marketer to do digital marketing for them and wanna have a sense what a digital marketer should be doing for them. So, you know, whether you're gathering with loved ones in person or online this holiday season, uh, someone you care about from outside your bubble, if you're in digital marketing, is going to ask you what you do. Now, for most people in most businesses, that's a really easy question to answer. But if you're in digital marketing, even if you're a guru, it can be a very difficult question to answer uh, because people outside of your bubble don't know the basics. So don't sweat it. I'm here to help. I'm going to talk to you today about... Um, you know, how to answer those questions and what digital marketing is. So I have a presentation and I'm gonna to switch to that and let's get started. As I go through this, I invite you to ask questions as you have them and we'll stop and answer them. So I've just completed a white paper uh, titled, What Does a Digital Marketer Do? Uh, 12 Digital Marketing Skills Explained. And at the end of today's webinar, I'll tell you where you can download that. The physical restrictions imposed by the pandemic have shaken the last digital laggards from the trees. Um, the digital transformation race has broadened. The first movers won, and now the rest of the world is playing catch up. So despite nearly 8% unemployment in the US, demand for skilled digital marketing talent remains at an all time high, despite the recession. Um, now that trade shows are gone, companies really have no choice. Digital is the last standing engagement channel. So nowadays, if you can't generate new business online, you can't generate new business at all. Uh, the cancellation of conferences, conventions, and sales meetings has decimated travel, commercial real estate, and hospitality, and cold calling keeps getting less effective every day. So, so just consider these facts for a minute. Uh, not only is $101 billion in spending driven by trade events and, and, and conferences gone, so are all the business deals that would have gotten done at those events. Uh, amongst the carnage, MarTech providers and early adopters saw staggering growth. And I'm not just talking about big players like Amazon, up and comers like Zoom, Peloton and Shopify saw share prices soar as well. Uh, but you know, not everyone has a Shopify website optimized for e-commerce. Some startups or scale-ups or change-ups or grown-ups are mid-pivot and they have a ton of work to get done to compete online. So, you know, when, when Dr. Anthony Fauci, the nation's leading infectious disease expert says, it's unlikely that things will get back to normal before 2021, uh, I think we can expect businesses that sat the digital revolution out to look hard at pivoting to digital in 2021. Um, to generate qualified leads from business customers online, what I'm gonna go through today are the essential skills required um, and you're going to need them in the order I'm going to give them to you. Uh, there are 12 of them. Uh, if you want to specialize, you need to get baseline fluency in the first four, and then you can drill down in any one of the five through 12 that interest you. But uh, without further ado, these are the uh, 12 essential digital marketing skills that will be most in demand in 2021. So, you know, this is a tough one because a lot of people got into marketing or, or PR or sales because they didn't like the numbers. They didn't want to have to deal with numbers. Um, but the truth is you can't improve what you can't measure. So this really is the first skill you need, uh, whether you intend to specialize or not. 
the ability to measure and evaluate what's working and what's not based on hard data is critical, foundational to digital marketing. At a bare minimum, you should know how to do website usage analysis using Google Analytics. So you should know how to go into Google Analytics and actually know what screens to look at and what filters to set to get intelligence that matters first. Second, you should know how to look at search engine visibility and how to assess your search engine visibility using a tool like Google Search Console. Uh, and third, uh, you should know how to monitor website user experience um, with heat mapping tools and session replay tools like Hotjar. Now, these tools that I just mentioned, Google Analytics, Google Search Console, and Hotjar, there are links to all of them in the white paper that you can download at the end of this session today. At a bare minimum, those are the three things you need to look at. Website usage statistics, search visibility statistics, and user, user experience statistics. Um, here you can see in this picture that I'm showing you is a screen on Google Analytics that actually shows me how much money I'm generating through different traffic sources. And so this is for a client and they, you can see the client in this case is generating uh, nearly $9,000 through direct traffic, people that go directly to the website, um, $7,500 through social media, 4,000 through people that find them through organic search, uh, 15,000 through email marketing, and then 5,500 through people that um, clicked on a link at another website back to them. So it's these types of analytics that really, really give you a sense of where to invest your time and energy because they show you where the money is. So the next thing, the next core skill, foundational skill that a digital marketer needs is some knowledge of marketing automation. Um, this map here is a process map that I designed for the US Department of State uh, in the run up to COP21, which was the conference of the parties where the global climate pact was negotiated. That was actually um, uh, that, that, uh, that Trump said he would not stick with, but that President Biden will no doubt get back to uh, and join that pact again. And here you can see sort of the flow of information uh, from a central unit in the in the uh, the State Department through to uh, a bureau and outside external advocates, and then through to embassies, which are called regions and posts. Um, and then at those embassies, uh, there are proponents and allies. And then, of course, you've got these external audience as well. Uh, so what's interesting about this process map is uh, there's a report that's done once a year by Edelman, which is the largest independent public relations agency called the Trust Barometer. They've been releasing it every year since 2000. And what they do is they sort of research and track and quantify the amount of trust people have globally for different sources of information. And uh, so they look at trust in government versus trust in business versus trust in institution. They also look at trusted sources, trust for academics versus trust for ele elected officials versus trust for CEOs versus trust for a person like you. And what we've seen, and this has been a trend uh, that's been exacerbated over the last 20 years, is that by and large, people tend to trust people like themselves more than elected officials or CEOs or sort of figureheads. Uh, I guess, you know, the, the um, uh, um, supposition is if someone's paying you to have an opinion, it's probably not just your opinion. But if you're not getting paid for that opinion, it's probably an honest opinion. And so what we find is that organizations, brands, government agencies, uh, institutions, NGOs are all operating at a trust deficit when they try to communicate through their own social media accounts. So. In this case, if US Department of State were to put out a tweet about climate change, and that tweet came from a US Department of State branded social media account, uh, anyone on the right 
who is a denier is going to say, you know what? I don't trust the U.S. Department of State because I see it as an extension of the Biden administration. I'm a conservative. I didn't vote for Biden. And so I disregard that message. On the other hand, you know, there are a number of experts and academics who are involved with these organizations and who communicate information on their behalf. In fact, most conservatives in America today are concerned about climate change. So uh, this is a strategy that puts the U.S. Department of State in a position to be able to tap those independent third party voices and communicate messages through them to their publics because we assess risk more on our tribal memberships than on the facts. And science is actually a culturally random variable. Um, rather than take the time to analyze the science ourselves, we assume that if someone who agrees with us on uh, uh, immigration and abortion and gun rights, um, if, if someone who agrees with us on complex issues like that, which are emotionally charged, then they're obviously rational people who are going to evaluate an issue like climate change the same way. There's so much information out there. So we'll just defer to them and follow them. And of course, in order to create messages at a large scale that would then be distributed and filtered out through third party independent sources, you would need some sort of an automation platform. Um, popular automation platforms are Salesforce, HubSpot, Zoho. Another popular automation platform uh, that was used, that's going to be used for this uh, strategy and that was used for it uh, during the Obama administration is a tool called Hootsuite, which allows you at a central level to create tweets and, and Facebook shares and other messages that can then be put into a content library and members of your community can then come take any of those messages and post them. And rather than retweeting or republishing a post from a government source, the, the uh, post is attributed to them. So number two, you got to know some automation. So the third thing is web performance. And I mean, I guess if I was going to explain this really simply, like if my grandfather were to ask me, what is it you do anyways? I might say something like, if our website goes down, we lose money. So I have all these alerts set up to make sure our site loads fast. If it doesn't, I get it fixed. Now, you don't necessarily have to be the person doing the actual fixing, right? But as a digital marketer, you have to know how to use tools to be able to monitor the health of your website and then alert the appropriate parties to fix it if there's a problem. Uh, common free tools that you can use for this are Screaming Frog, which is a fantastic tool that you can download, uh, Google PageSpeed Indites, Insights, a simple tool where you put in your URL and it'll show you what needs to be improved. That's what this screenshot is from. And then last but not least, a tool called GT Metrics. Now, again, don't worry about writing these down because all these tools um, are in the white paper that you can download at the end of today's session. So the final foundational skill in digital marketing before you specialize, which applies to every aspect of digital marketing, is search engine optimization. Of all the digital media channels through which prospects engage with your company online, organic search is the most important because it delivers the most qualified audience. So if someone is searching for an answer to a problem you can solve, they have a higher commercial intent and are further along in the customer journey than if they're just perusing Facebook or Twitter wasting time. When we start searching, we're problem aware, right? We have a problem that we're aware of and we're actively searching to try to solve it. As we continue to search, we become solution aware, which means we begin to see different providers and different companies that can solve our problem and we become aware of different keywords. So we might start searching something like monitor mount to get our 
computer monitor off our desk. And then we might see, oh, monitor arm is what I want. Then we might search, search monitor arm. Now we've gone from problem aware to solution aware. And then as we search more, we might see certain brands start to come up. And we might actually go to those brand pages and see you know, what are some of the most popular brands that provide those services. Then we become brand aware. So that's really the process of SEO from an organic search standpoint. Getting onto someone's radar when they're problem aware, getting onto their radar again when they're solution aware, getting onto their radar again when they're uh, brand aware. Um, but you know, understanding what words people search uh, is um, a proxy for popular language. And popular language is what people use on social media as well. Uh, it's what people are talking about on forums, on Reddit. Uh, it's what people are asking questions about when they call the customer service department. Um, so really understanding keywords and embracing popular language is central to digital marketing. And I would even argue that it's the strategic compass that guides your content marketing effort as well. Because really the keywords people are asking about are, are indicative of the problems that they're concerned with and the answers they need for you to connect with them. People don't buy what they need, they buy what they want. So we really have to create content for the problems they're aware of. If we create content for the problems that they're not aware of, we'll miss the mark. So for me, I specialize in B2B growth marketing. So if you search B2B growth marketing, I come up number one. And, uh, you know, that was a, a lot of work. It, it's taken a lot of time to get there, but that's how you should be thinking. You should be thinking from a unbranded term standpoint, what problems when people search, what information when people search for, do I want to come up and get found against? Um, popular tools, uh, research platforms for uh, understanding the basics of search engine optimization are Ahrefs, Moz, and SEMrush. And again, there are links to all those three tools in the white paper. So the fifth digital marketing tool that you need to be competent in is email marketing. Email marketing is about delivering relevant communications uh, through personalization. Uh, and you can personalize at three different levels. You can personalize at the account level, and this sort of ties into what is called account-based marketing, right? If you had a certain account, a certain company that you wanted to sell to, you could create a ideal customer profile for that company, and you could look at you know what it, what it is that they need to do, what are their goals, and you could use that information to then tailor communication specifically to people at that organization. At the next level, you can personalize from a role-based standpoint. So you might personalize to buyers who have a different uh, performance indicator at a job, right? Uh, someone who's in marketing is measured by different uh, uh, key performance indicators than someone who's in sales and someone who's in service. And so, you know, being sensitive to that and tailoring your communications to work for those audiences is what personalization is all about. And then last but not least is individual personalization. And this is for those high value prospects uh, that are further down the funnel where you actually may know their name or you may know what sports they like or you may know some other personal interests or you may be able to reference a conversation that you had, right? Those are sort of the three areas of personalization for email marketing. Um, and so if I was explaining email marketing at a holiday party to my uncle Charlie, who was in his eighties, I would say something like, I write emails that get personalized and sent to thousands of people who've signed up to receive updates from our company, right? It's just a straightforward explanation. And then he would probably nod and get it rather than get frustrated and you, and you feeling worthless because you couldn't explain it. Um, when it comes to segmentation of lists, uh, you can kind of put people into two different buckets. You can put people into those who are engaged or who have engaged, 
of your email and those who haven't engaged. If someone hasn't engaged with you, right, they should receive a more aggressive message. And then if they don't respond, they should be abandoned. They should be, you know, taken out of your database. There's no need to send email to people who don't want it. Um, I have some really useful tools for you to help you with your email marketing. Um, the first is really the most important piece of an email marketing campaign, which is the subject line, since that's what we use to decide whether or not to open or ignore a message. So I've got a great tool for you um, at a site called subjectline.com. And it's a free tool you can use to put your intended subject line in and get a score, and it'll give you recommendations for how to improve your subject line. Uh, to get good at email marketing, you need to learn how to personalize and segment campaigns with tools like MailChimp, ConvertKit, and Constant Contact. If you are good with any of those three platforms, you have skills that will always be in high demand. As you saw when I showed you the analytics earlier in today's presentation, most of the revenue on that particular uh, screen were coming from marketing. And so it is true, particularly with considered purchases, that marketing is where the rubber meets the road. That's where interest uh, becomes consideration, consideration becomes evaluation, and obviously it's through sales where evaluation becomes a purchase. Number three, content mark, I'm sorry, number six, content marketing. So content marketing is authoring, compelling, useful, smart web content designed to get shared and found by leads who are looking for answers to questions that your product or service solves. If I was explaining this one to Uncle Charlie, uh, I would say I write articles, I produce webinars, I record podcasts, and I make videos that people find when they search Google for answers to problems our company solves. That's what content marketing is. Since someone's actively searching, right, the idea is to create informational content designed to get found and self-qualify them as potential buyers. B2B content marketing is particularly effective as a way of leading prospects through the funnel to conversion because Purchasing decisions uh, at businesses are typically made by committees, right? There are a number of different people with different objectives who must agree on a solution provider for the decision to happen. And that's the sales cycle. And so staying top of mind through the sales cycle uh, is something that you do through content marketing. Um, you know, sometimes you have to fill out a form to download content. And when you do, right, that becomes a lead that gets nurtured via email. Um, one thing I think it's important to know about uh, uh, content marketing is unlike copywriting, content marketing is really more about creating informative, more journalistic style, educational content. Um, sure, it can be entertaining, but it needs to be informative. Uh, there's a real difference in writing style between content marketing and, uh, you know, product content or service or offer-oriented content, uh, which is going to be more like marketing copy. And we'll talk about that as well, because that's an important digital marketing skill. Uh, content marketing is more like journalism, uh, whereas marketing copy is more like advertising. Content marketers need web analytics and SEO skills to hone their written materials based on what's popular online and tools that you can use to help you decide what you should be creating content about include uh, answer the public, reading trending questions on relevant subs on Reddit, and checking what's trending on in social on BuzzSumo and Uber Suggest. And again, links to all of these in the uh, white paper, uh, and I'll tell you where to get that at the end of today's session. Oh, this is a uh, guide to content marketing if you're interested, and uh, the link is on the screen. So let's talk for a minute about blogging. This is the seventh essential 
digital marketing skill for 2021. Now, blogging is the maintenance and publishing of a brand's news media outlet. Bloggers write editorial content designed to inform and inspire rather than sell. For B2Bs, maintaining a blog that helps customers solve problems is a very effective strategy, even if your blog doesn't seem that popular from a traffic standpoint. And I'll give you an example. Um, in B2B, there's a company called Indium, and they sell solder paste. Solder paste, you know, the material that's used to affix uh, electronic, electronic components to circuit boards. And uh, they use their blog to convert content into contacts into cash. And here's how they do it. Um, the first thing you may be thinking is why would a solder paste company maintain a blog for such a niche audience? Well, it may be true that not a lot of people buy solder paste, but those that do back up the truck. So if a blog post generates one sale, it's going to be a very large sale. As a result, Indium has 17 bloggers maintaining 73 blogs. They've seen a 600% jump in leads since they started blogging. They even have a full-time Chinese blogger blogging in Chinese now. Uh, since the blog has grown so large, they actually stopped attending trade shows 10 years ago, long before trade shows were interrupted by the coronavirus. Um, good bloggers are good writers and good writers are avid readers. So if you want to get good at blogging, allocate an hour a day to read popular blogs in your category. And if you have something to add, leave a comment and let them know so that you get on their radar. But make sure if you leave a comment that you say something useful and advance the dialogue forward constructively instead of leaving, you know, a generic great post comment. Um, because that's not going to be seen as useful. In addition uh, to developing your writing skills, if you want to blog for business, learn WordPress. There are other platforms out there, but WordPress is the gold standard blogging engine. So let's talk about marketing copy or copywriting. Copywriting is the use of persuasive language to convert buyers from awareness to consideration. Copywriting is the use of rhetoric to get prospects to notice, read, remember, and respond to your message. What's so interesting is that in the Elizabethan era, rhetoric was actually the basis of education. But with the age of enlightenment and the birth of science, we shifted from stories to facts. So interestingly enough, as research from MIT PhD of physics, Joe Rom proposes in his book, How to Go Viral and Reach Millions, our beliefs are still seduced more by our emotional stories than they are by cold hard facts. And he argues that we actually make decisions based on gut and rationalize them with our intellect. Facts are not what persuade us. Sure, facts can be peppered in, and you could certainly have persuasive stories that include facts, but the real secret to effective copywriting is striking an emotional chord and using persuasive language to make it memorable. So whereas facts are the stuff of journalism, copywriters live more in the realm of story, and they specialize in using what's called figures of speech, such as metaphors, memes, analogies, alliteration, rhymes, repetition, all laced with irony to get your attention and convince and convert us into leads. If you can develop these skills by taking note and saving copies of the communications that get your attention and then applying those same techniques to your own writing, you can learn to become a good copywriter. Some online tools that can help you with this include relatedwords.com, rhyme zone, idiom search. And regardless of the title, Joe Rom's book is a must read. 
I dog-eared every page, highlighted the heck out of it, underlined it. This guy is an MIT physicist who gave up science for communications when he realized that people don't make decisions based on facts. They make decisions based on stories. So the, the next skill, the ninth skill, digital essential digital marketing skill that you need um, to know is podcasting. The theory of multiple intelligence shows that some people absorb information better by listening than reading. And for those who'd rather listen, there's podcasting. Podcasting is the delivery of an original audio program to a subscriber base. And they work great for nurturing leads and building and managing one-to-many relationships. So these are the six benefits of podcasting. One, podcasts allow listeners to time shift and place shift media consumption. Two, they're 100% efficient because downloads are opt-in. Three, they're accessible to a global audience regardless of geographic boundaries. Four, they draw a more educated, affluent, influential audience. Five, they give marketers a way to bypass the news media and go direct to the consumer. And six, they're the most cost-effective electronic media distribution channel available. Now, I've been podcasting since 2005. I've uh, delivered over a million downloads. And I will tell you that successful podcast producers put the needs of their audience first. Rather than go with a news format, if you're thinking about podcasting, it's going to be much easier to produce a more evergreen, feature-oriented interview program. Uh, because that content has an extended shelf life. Remember, this is on-demand content. People don't get it right away. It takes them a few weeks to download it, so you want an extended shelf life for your content. In addition to learning how to book high-profile guests and produce interesting discussions uh, that people want to listen to, you also need to know audio recording, post-production, search engine optimization, because the text transcript should be search optimized and how to secure distribution on iTunes and Spotify. Um, here are technical tools to help you do all that. Uh, a free uh, audio recording program that you can download called Audacity, open source, terrific for podcasting. Um, Levelator, a free tool you can use to adjust and um, optimize the audio levels of your podcast before you distribute it. And Blueberry, a fantastic tool that you can use to distribute your audio content to Spotify, Apple, uh, Stitcher, and seven other of the top podcast podcatchers, they used to call them, uh, podcast listening uh, platforms. Okay, number 10, social media. It's funny because when you say to someone that you do digital marketing, this is what they think, oh, you do social media. But this is really, I think that uh, if you were to prioritize all the skills, this is number 10 on the scale. Because what is the point of talking up a brand on social media if you can't direct someone to a location where that interest can be converted into a lead or an, a, a trial or a product evaluation or sale? Um, unfortunately, you know, most people start here because it's easy and it's fast and it's fun. Uh, but if you're not sharing something that generates leads, what's the point? And if you don't have a website with a path to purchase, you can't make a market for anything. So, I mean, social media is a great hobby, but unless you're making a market for a product or service, you're not digital marketing, you're just messing around with social media. So I would say start by getting your own web presence in order right? You want content that people can find through search because let's face it, uh, people who are searching are further along in the content funnel and have higher commercial intent. Uh, before you even start with social media, right? You need to look at search. You need to look at your own website. You need to look at uh, content marketing. Uh, so start there. And I'll tell you, you know, with the pandemic, LinkedIn has become a bloodbath. I mean, like you can't accept a friend request from someone without getting a pitch. 
everybody's all over you looking for deal flow on LinkedIn because they don't have a way to do it on their own website. So they're up against a brick wall. Um, remember something about social media, okay? Uh, the way social media works, right, is it's designed to generate clicks for advertisers, not you, right? You get to share posts there for free so that they in the social media network can sell ads against your content to advertisers, right? Proximity drives conversions. There's a saying in Silicon Valley goes like this. If it's free, you're the product. So before you invest time and energy in social media marketing, get your website in order first, then search optimize it, then get your email up and running. At that point, you're ready to try your hand at social media. This is the most crowded area in digital marketing. And many employers and clients, uh, you know, look at it as sort of a proxy for whether or not you're legit. Like, you know, if you're a relatively unknown brand and, and you've got a website and you've got a link to your Twitter or your Facebook, they're going to click on that link, look at the number of followers and basically judge you by that. They're going to say, oh, you know what? They have enough followers. They're legit. I'll check them out. Or, oh, they want to get two followers. Who are these guys? So really the reason to build a following more than anything else is as social proof to potential customers employees, anybody you're trying to, any stakeholder you're trying to communicate with, that people endorse your viewpoint. Um, if you want to go this route, I would say, you know, build your following first. And popular tools to do this include TalkWalker, Hootsuite, uh, and Twitter Analytics. Uh, Facebook Insights is also a great tool here. Uh, so you can see what's working and focus and allocate resources on what's effective. So the 11th essential digital marketing skill is digital PR. Some people would say all PR is digital PR nowadays, but for the purpose of this discussion, we'll confine digital PR to guest blogging and authoring content that gets placed and hosted on neutral third-party websites. Um, this is really an important skill set because this is where credibility comes in, right? In all the other channels we were talking about, we're saying things and we're distributing them ourselves. So we're creating a message that's attributed to ourselves. Uh, digital PR is about getting relevant, high-profile websites and blogs to write about you and to publish links back to your site. And of course, you know, this is what guest blogging is all about because there are so many high profile blogs today that accept guest posts and part of digital public relations, probably the biggest part today is uh, drafting guest posts that wind up on those blogs uh, so that you can get in exchange for providing the post to them, a link back to your site. Uh, those links back to your site uh, send a signal to Google uh, to rank you higher for the keywords that you're linking. Uh, so really, digital PR is about building visibility and credibility through neutral third parties. Because if other experts who don't work for you say your products are good, that's a powerful endorsement. Unlike conventional media, media relations, digital PR you know, is, is about this guest blogging in exchange for backlinks to lift your search ranking. In the old days, uh, marketers led with PR. Like, you know, I used to be at a PR agency and it wasn't uncommon for a new company to come to us and say, hey, help put us on the map. But that doesn't work anymore because now when you pitch a journalist and ask them to write about you or you send them a guest post and say, hey, I'll put this on your blog, the first thing they do is check you out online. And if your site doesn't look great and if you don't have a social media following, you're probably not even going to get considered, which is why I advocate this sort of four-tiered approach, which starts with owned media progresses to social media, and then moves from there to earned media, which is digital PR. Um, so your social media following is a veritable proxy 
for how much of an influencer you are. Got less than a thousand followers? Eh. How do they know you're legit if you don't have a vibrant community? Again, the logical sequence is step one, owned media, getting your own website in order. Step two, building a community on social media. And step three, after you've built an impressive website and a master respectable following is earned media. Um, some of the earned media tools that you can use uh, to support this effort are Scission, Meltwater, Talkwalker, IPR software and Muckrack. Muckrack is a site where you can get a profile for yourself as a journalist and collect links to all the stories you've ever written. So if you're pitching someone to put up a guest post uh, that you want them to run on their blog, you can include a link to your Muckrack profile and they can see all the stories that you've written in one place without sending them a bunch of links. Last but not least is online advertising. Now, if you have a lot of money and you want quick results, you can actually start with advertising because you can drive traffic faster. And, um, you know, if you can drive traffic faster than you can through organic search, email, referrals, and social media, you can get insights a lot quicker about what's going to work and what's not going to work from a messaging standpoint. Um, but if you're a B2B catering to a niche audience, uh, even lots of money may not do the trick because the audience is so small, it's just going to take time to uh, test them. On the other hand, if you're selling something, you know, that's broad, a broad product like a B2B product like insurance or computers or, or anything like that to business customers, advertising can be really effective. Um, if you want to test out different approaches, you need traffic because more visitors means more data and there's no data like more data. Uh, in this book, AI Superpowers, former Google China president Kai-Fu Li argues that the lack of regulation in China around consumer data collections and harvesting has actually put Chinese artificial intelligence startups ahead of their U.S. competitors because they have more data that they can analyze to determine what consumers want. And as an, you know, I think a good example of this is TikTok, right? I mean, TikTok's algorithm is better at sustaining our attention than any of its predecessors. I mean, they just know how to figure out what you want to see and give you more of it to extend the session time. Uh, in digital marketing, online advertising today is essentially Google ads and paid social media. Um, so if you want to learn this skill, uh, the tools are Google ads, Facebook ads, Twitter ads, and LinkedIn marketing solutions. And again, I have links to all those four sites uh, in the white paper if you wanna check those out. Um, if you're just starting out, like if you're new to social media and you're new to digital marketing, uh, think about which of these areas align best with your existing skills, because it's going to be much easier to specialize in one of these areas than it will be to master them all at the same time. Uh, on the other hand, once you have earned your stripes and become a generalist, you're in a position to lead the digital marketing charge, uh, but that comes with time. The important thing is there are more companies out there that need good digital marketing than there are good digital marketers. And so this is a huge opportunity for anyone who wants to dive deeper in this space. So if you want to download the report, you can do it at ericschwartzman.com forward slash essential dash digital dash marketing dash skills. Again, it's ericschwartzman.com forward slash essential dash digital dash marketing dash skills. And that's this entire report with all these links and all these sites. So you've got essentially a cheat sheet um, that you can use uh, to uh, decide whether or not digital marketing is for you. Um, and also uh, to explain to your loved ones this holiday season, uh, what digital marketing actually is. So uh, let's see, it looks like we have some questions. Um, so, Maria, the uh, slides are all images that are from the white paper. 
So all you have to do to get this slides is just download the white paper. And just to make it crystal clear for you, I'll go ahead and include the white paper, uh, the link to the white paper in the chat. Actually, I'll type it as an answer here. And I'll put it in the chat as well. So just to review, here's your PR and digital marketing explainer cheat sheet. And you can use any of these answers this holiday season uh, when someone outside your bubble asks, what is it you do anyway? Okay, one, I make sure it's easy for our customers to get information about what we sell on our website so they can buy more stuff from us. What is it you do anyway? I figure out which people visiting our website are most likely to buy from us and hand off their contact info to our folks in the sales department. What is it you do anyway? If our website goes down, we lose money. So I have all these alerts set up to make sure our site loads fast. If it doesn't, I get it fixed. What is it you do anyway? I research the words people search when they're looking for things we sell and make sure we're using those words online. What is it you do anyway? I write persuasive web copy that uses rhyme, repetition, stories, and metaphors to capture and keep people's attention online. What is it you do anyway? I write articles, produce webinars, record podcasts, and make videos that people find when they search for answers to problems that our company solves. What is it you do anyway? Instead of writing about what everyone else is writing about, I write about ideas that are new, so our brand is seen as a thought leader instead of a thought repeater. What is it you do? I get people to follow our company on social media, so when people check us out, they see a community who endorse our viewpoint. And last but not least, what is it you do? I build visibility and credibility for our company by getting reporters and people with a lot of followers on social media to say good things about us online. So there it is, your uh, explainer cheat sheet. Um, any questions? You know, I wrote this up because I have been in this situation many times you don't see the white paper. Uh, Greg, let me put it back in the, click on that link, Greg, and let me know if that goes through for you. And please post a chat to the, post a, a note again to the chat, Greg. I'm looking for it. Uh, oh, oh, Roberta, Roberta. So we have somebody on the call today who our community may be able to help. Greg, you're not seeing it. That is so odd. Let me let me just check this out. Huh? Are you able to load this, uh, Greg? I'm, can I bring you on screen, Greg? Let me let me see what's going on here. If you wouldn't mind, I'd like to. So I'm going to bring Greg on screen. Hey Greg, you want to um, you want to share your screen and show me what you see when you uh, when you when you go to that link? That'd be helpful. Can you uh, uh, take the uh, link from the uh, chat there? and paste it in your browser. And, uh, you know, the other thing is I'll give you my email address and I can also just email it to you if you can't for some reason download it. Uh, I'd be interested to know from other people on the, uh, on the call here, are you able to get to the white paper? 
Is this an isolated incident or can other people get to the white paper? Okay, John says you can get to it. All right, so um, Greg, shoot me an email and I'll, and I'll send it to you. Okay, Greg, you got it. Perfect. So I wind up in this position quite a bit with my mother-in-law who, you know, asked me, what do I do? And then, you know, before I can even get a sentence out, she's yawning. So I, I've always thought, you know what, I really need to nail this. So that's why I created this. And also I felt like, you know, people don't really understand what, what digital marketing is. It's a mystery to a lot of people. And um, it's so disparate that uh, I felt like there needed to be one conclusive, you know, white paper that had all that information in one place, uh, both for, you know, the novice who's looking to specialize, uh, for the client who's looking to hire someone, uh, and, uh, you know, for the insider practitioner who wants to explain it to their family. Um, I'm going to bring someone else on screen here who I've been exchanging emails with because she needs help and someone in this community may be able to help her. So Roberta, I'm gonna bring you on screen. And hopefully Bert, Roberta, can you start your camera and, uh, and tell us what, it, what kind of help you need because there may be someone in the community here who can help you. We see you, Roberta, but we don't hear you. Not yet. I oh, we hear you. Okay. Yes, Roberta. Tell us. What okay. We the host has asked you to start my video. I'm doing it again. Can you see me now? We can see and hear you. How can oh, we help you? Perfect. My husband, who passed away last month at 86 after a long illness, was one of the cowboys who really started the tech revolution. He developed the first word processing program for the personal computer in the late 70s, early 80s. He developed one of the first spreadsheet programs. So uh, he knows a lot of the old hands, those who were still around and they know who he is. And uh, I think it's, I know it's appropriate. I used to work in public relations before I retired. So I know enough that he's an appropriate person to send something to tech media, but I don't have a tech media list and I'm not sure if a traditional obituary is the appropriate thing to send. I, if it's reasonable, I can pay for this service. I'm not necessarily looking for someone free. It's just really important to his son and I that uh, people know who he is and know that he's passed. He already has a lot of his memorabilia in the Computer History Museum in Silicon Valley. And uh, we'll be giving more as soon as we can go through everything. Roberta, tell us his name. Oh my gosh, did I forget? Well, I wrote it in the chat and then I, his name is Seymour Rubenstein. And tell Are us the names of the programs that he developed. Oh, WordStar, uh, Surpass, which became Quattro Pro, and the End User Licensing Agreement. Wonderful. So uh, Roberta and has he's put- in Wikipedia if you want to know more. Roberta has put her contact information in the chat. If you can help her, she's looking for help. And I wanted to just get that out to the community. And I also wanted to send condolences to you, Roberta, and, um, and send uh, best wishes to you and your son for the holidays. Thank you very much. And thank you. It was very interesting to see the next iteration of... Uh, 
using tech more effectively. It's part of the reason I retired because I knew I, I was 65 and I knew I had a lot to learn if I was going to keep in the business. Well, hopefully you learned it today, Roberta. I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody. I hope that I can uh, hear from somebody soon. Thank you. Great. So, hey, if you're a PR person, there's an account for you and call her up and and help her out. It sounds like it sounds to me like it's legit and you could probably get it placed. Uh, I think Julie, I think Julie's right about that. So listen, I want to thank you all for joining me today. Um, Again, you know, we have this is a program is available as a podcast as well. So, um, you know, if you don't always have time to uh, participate in the live, uh, you can always just sign up uh, for the podcast uh, version. And I'm putting a link to that in the chat. And then, you know, when you're walking the dog or grocery shopping or mowing the lawn, if you are a podcast listener, uh, you can time shift and play shift this content as well. We have a fantastic guest next week. We will be talking to Alex DeRitter, the CTO from Inc. for All, a content optimization platform about topic clusters and uh, uh, cornerstone content. So I hope you'll join us for that. And uh, we also have um, the editor from um, Crunchbase News after that. And then we have the personal technology columnist from the New York Times after that. So we have a terrific end of the year um, set of uh, 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 Webinar Wednesdays, Earn Media Podcasts available for you. So I hope you'll join us. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you next week.